object. That's a, a GNU grep symbol for actually labeling the file uh, in front of it because you're going to do a lot of these files. This is big data and grep. Um, you're going to only understand the output if you've got that, uh, that file that's matched name in front of that data. Um, you put in the pattern that you're looking for. That's the map phase. The reduce phase, minus R, is cat. You're concatenating all the results. That's it. Map reduce grep. Um, the API documents have a whole host of job patterns. I'm going to show you a couple of more because these are fun and they're one-liners and they're completely powerful. Um, the Manta documentation on how to do total word count, I actually got to see this in May. I, I was at uh, D-Trace class and um, Dave Pacheco um, walked me through this one. Um, he's got a, a bunch of text files that are all the works of Shakespeare and um, the dual word count. So you're going to do a map produced version of word count. Um, so here the input list is a list of plain text objects. Uh, which could be mailbox files or source code or all kinds of things. The output is a single object with one line, counting the total number of characters, words, and lines in all the files. The full command line example is starts with the mfind command, manta find, and the find job is going to actually go through and just find all the files in this um, directory with all the uh, with all the Shakespeare stuff in it. Uh, that's going to be piped into mjob create, so that list of files becomes the input for the the map phase. Um, and that uh, map phase runs word count in place on top of those files by launching a virtual machine that runs word count. Um, the reduce phase is a one-liner in awk. And that one-liner in awk um, sums up the three columns of numbers and then prints it out. That uh, is sent to your big data, run in place, data doesn't move, you get back three numbers. Total number of characters, words, and lines in all the files. The rest JSON API looks like this. So it has um, a map phase and a reduce phase, and the executable is specified uh, like that. It gives you exactly the same output over a REST HTTP interface. Is that cool? How many of you don't use Unix? Okay. Cool. It's not going to work on Windows. Okay, it's cool for all you old Unix. Shh. Don't say that. <laughs> I'm, I've already dated myself. Come on. <laughs> so, um, uh, thumbnail creation, uh, image conversion. Um, if you want to do transcoding of videos, the executables are already in the image. Um, this is a few lines of, uh, again, an M find, which goes in collects the list of files to input, piped into mjob create. This is running image magic convert, which is going to convert whatever files in the input list into PNG files. That's piped to uh, an output. There's no reduce phase in here. It's just doing an image conversion. So you get a new directory. This is the, uh, the job. That's the, um, the hash or the identi identity of the virtual machine that's run. And then that's put into uh, a directory that you can query with mjob outputs. So thumbnail creation in place without moving the data off of storage. Uh, and those can be put into a public directory and used as part of a content delivery network via snap links without moving the data. Go ahead. What's the parallel part if there is any? Um, if you've got um, large numbers of data sets, um, those, those virtual machines are executed across all of the data on all of the servers wherever it's stored. So part of the, um, the implementation includes um, a new file system driver that, um, that manages the file system's um, implementation and um, relationship to the user store across multiple machines. If I'm lucky enough to have all my files on one one node, then there would be only one process. Um, yeah, if your data is that small. Yes. I mean, if I had many nodes, but just what happens that the files I'm looking at are on one node only, then only... Yeah, yeah it, it's, it's only going to execute where your data is. Yeah. Okay. 
So the result of your map reviews grant is written to a file, and this file is distributed across the file system again. The result of map reviews job. Yeah. It's it's a, it's a well it's a it's a file which is distributed itself. So if I want to get it out of the system, that's where the cost lies. The only cost of the of the post process. Uh, Cost it at the end. Sorry? I'll show you the cost at the end. Okay. Cover that. So, what can you run? Um, thousands of ready to use Unix packages are already on the virtual machine. So, if you've got scripts in most of the major languages. Um, You're talking about the virtual machine on Giant. It's, a, it's an, yes. On Giant. On, on Giant, it's on the virtual machine? It's on SmartOS. It's an Illumos virtual machine. It's not a Linux virtual machine, it's not a Windows. Oh, okay, okay. So, it is platform specific. So these are the binaries that are pre-compiled, but they will run your interpreted languages. So you've got Python code, it'll run. Um, if you don't have something on that list, you can create what's called an asset. And this is actually how I have to use it for a lot of the scientific code I have, which is compiled to, it's C compiled to binaries. So I, ha I have a build farm, which I'll show you at the end. Um, I build to a whole bunch of different Linux, Mac OS, Windows distributions, so that's my life. Um, but the assets, if you have something that's not on the virtual machine image, the stock virtual machine image, you basically tar up a bunch of files, put it onto Manta, and instruct the Manta code to actually pick up the asset, import it into the virtual machine, and execute an untar process, and execute code inside that uh, that asset. So you can run uh, anything that you can get to work on uh, on an Lumos operating system inside a Manta VM. And you can resize it to, uh, to essentially the memory limits of the machines that are running it. Some of the use cases are um, running checksums over your data to assure its integrity. You can do that without moving the data. Um, log processing. There are some great examples on some of the, uh, the the links and blogs that have been posted around this for doing clickstream analysis and MapReduce on logs directly without putting them into a database or Hadoop. Text processing, including search. I showed you a quick example, but you can, as you can imagine, there are more elaborate ones. Uh, I'm going to put all this stuff up on uh, SlideShare, by the way. Um, image, uh, sorry, image processing, converting formats, generating thumbnails, resizing, transcoding extracting segments, resizing, anything you can do with a command line to uh, an image or a media stream you can do in place. Um, data analysis, data mining, you can run our code on top of the data without moving the data off of storage. You can run Python code on top of it without moving it out of storage. Um, so the left side is kind of the canned joint, um, the right side is mine. Um, the democratization of big data is actually uh, Jason Hoffman's. He's the chief technology officer and the guy that uh, makes most of this stuff work, including hiring all the great people that, uh, that make it work. But uh, the point here is that it's no longer in the hands of the few. The best example of this is um, GE and Rolls-Royce. So anytime you get on a plane and it's flying and it's got an engine, that engine is sending data back about its health to Rolls-Royce and GE, and they're doing analytics and they're they're basically monitoring the entire fleet of engines that they build on the fly. If you're making... No, no pun intended? No. no on the fly? <laughs> no wheels Yes. There are always puns intended. Um, unintentional puns are very ironic. Um, so, but uh, if you're making mass market devices that are transportative, uh, automotive, e-health monitoring system, apps, sensor networks, if you're trying to figure out, um, you know, uh, like uh, some of the scientists I know, how microbes are growing in various habitats and they're building uh, Raspberry Pi or Arduino boards that, uh, that have sensors on them. All of these things can be pushing data up and into an environment where it can be stored um, and analyzed. Um, a crazy idea that occurred to me was um, scientific paper PDF collections. We scientists write papers, and there's this old infrastructure that uh, makes us pay for them to get, pay for them to get them back. And um, since the web has um, 
has changed publishing from paper to uh, you know, PDF and, and other formats. Um, scientists want to run a text analysis over all of science, but we can't do that because the publishers won't let us. They want to charge us 30 bucks to download a PDF. So um, the scientists are allowed to download PDFs from the library and store them on the cloud in collections. What Manta allows you to do is actually federate all those collections and then run jobs across them. So you can put a collection of copyright material, PDFs, that never leave where you put them. They're your collection. But a black box compute job can come by and see what's inside without violating copyright. <laughs> well, the data model's already there, and since Elsevier bought up Mendeley, um, you know, it's been validated. So private collections are allowed. And um, if you're not a human violating the copyright, it will be interesting. Um, and, of course, the, uh, the big thing is um, um, genome sequence analysis. Um, a predecessor to this, um, if you look at the amount of people that are banking cord blood for newborns, there's about a million units of cord blood stored already in about five or six years of this, uh, this becoming a, a thing. Um, that's going to follow on with genome sequencing of that many people, and a million genome sequences will just about exhaust the storage capacity in the industry. So that's going to be big. That data is going to be too big to move. And running compute pipelines to take the raw data off the instruments, convert it into polished, finished, annotated genome sequence that's interpretable, that doctors can understand and, um, and that people can understand, that's going to require uh, this kind of computing infrastructure that puts the data there, validates that it hasn't changed, has backup copies, validates the integrity of the data, uh, and that you can push new compute jobs onto it every time we figure out how to extract something new from the data. Recomputing the data is just as, uh, as much of a, of a big data problem uh, as the initial computing. So we talk about metadata, meta pipelines, not just running a pipeline, but running the pipeline again over all of the accumulated data when that data is accumulating uh, and growing exponentially. So that's, that's really what I think about is that last thing. That's the thing that, uh, that makes me excited about um, this type of uh, implementation. Okay, so here's the pricing. Um, it's compute charges are by the second. It's 40 microcents per gigabyte of DRAM per second. Um, there's a table. I've got a link to that. This is going up on SlideShare so you can get at this. Um, if you run a thousand parallel tasks uh, in 32 gigs DRAM instances on a thousand objects and they each take a second then you use 32,000 seconds of time, and the cost of the job is $1.28. So that's the work through. So it's kind of a, a three-dimensional pricing scheme. Uh, the storage charges are slight. If you don't do any computing, the storage charges are slightly less than Amazon E3. Um, and it scales with uh, the amount of storage that you're doing. Bandwidth, bandwidth in uploads are free. Bandwidth out, uh, if you're doing CDN type stuff, you're going to have to pay by tier bandwidth. Uh, and there's, there are request types that, uh, that also have charges. Um, deleting is free. So, yay. Um, so that's, uh, that's it. I'm, I hope I didn't uh, take too long. I know this is uh, going over. But um, that's, the, that's, the, that's the cloud I have on my desk that runs my build farm. So I build on 32-bit and 64-bit Linuxes, um, my scientific code that's used by nuclear NMR spectroscopists. And um, so I have to code it and, and release um, completely self-contained binary executables with no dependencies so that scientists can actually install and run it. And, um, I, I have 14 different executable distributions on mostly Linuxes, uh, still PowerPC, Macintosh, Mac, Mac OS X on PowerPC, uh, Windows, and, um, and Solaris. So those virtual machines all run on two little uh, HP Z210 single Xeon small form factor workstations, which are actually interconnected with a 10 gigabit link. And um, 
Project FIFO is a, a complete Erlang implementation of a management system that uh, provisions um, virtual machines, launches them. Um, they can be SmartOS uh, virtual machines, uh, or they can be KVM machines running Windows, um, FreeBSD, Linuxes, and so on. So um, it costs me no money in software to set this up. And it works. Quick question. Uh, so sharding, let's say I have a log data of like a month's worth of log data and I want to analyze it. Uh, should I have to shard it to take advantage of parallelism myself by splitting it, say, 30 days files or one file each and then ingest it by the processing model? Uh, that, that would be, um, that wouldn't be too hard to do, I think. I mean, the, the other thing is you've got a directory structure. Okay. So you, you, you can put in a hierarchy. mfind will go through the directory and pull out all the files. But what I'm trying to understand is that the sharding is something that the end user has to think ahead of time before they take advantage of that. Uh, yeah, I think you have to think about it. But um, I think you'll find that the tools there are... Um, pretty interesting in, in that they're um, like a bigger Unix machine. So, so let's say you have a big file, let's say two big of file, then I have to split that file across the machines. That's what you're saying. Uh, how big is the file? Let's say two gig. Two gig? Um, the, the file size is, um, is not limited. <coughs> like, let's say I have data that I so how are you going to import that again? Well, it's not my infrastructure, so. <laughs> but yes, um, how, how, how is it going to be put there? Yeah. Um, uh, there's still, you know, bandwidth and transfer to the data center. It, it's, um, um, so this seems right, I mean, okay, MapReduce and distributed data store. Seems remarkably similar to Hadoop in many ways, or not remarkably. It is similar to Hadoop. What's uh, I mean? What's the advantages here? Uh, what, what are the differences? I mean, can you just contrast them a little bit? Um, you, a system administrator can run this. That's that. That's one. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I can't do what I do on Hadoop, which is um, uh, I, I need to run a simulation. Um, the simulation runs in memory. It actually is more expensive for me to run the simulation here and move the data than to actually put the put the simulation data in place. So, so I, I can't execute. I can't execute. What's that? You're saying run the simulation on the Yeah, I, I'm not sure how to run that. C simulation inside a Hadoop process without it, you know, executing a virtual machine and a shell. <coughs> Regarding uh, ZFS, when, when one of your nodes uh, is uh, lost, do you lose data? And is your F5 system? Uh, yeah, the, the, um, I, I, I did skip over that for the sake of time, but let me just go back. Well, a little too far. Here's a ZFS. Yeah, so, so this, uh, this bit here, every object is stored in two ZFS pools by default, um, which you can change uh, and, and set that for your storage up to, uh, to six separate copies. So, so exactly. you set the policy, the default is two independent ZFS pools. So if you lose one? If you well, there's two layers. One is the ZFS itself. So if you lose a disk, um, ZFS is set up with um, uh, RAID Z to proactively scan for um, hardware errors on the disk and to start resilvering as soon as it detects bad sectors. So that's already running in the background. That's the enterprise grade ZFS file system. Um, the if you detect if you if you run a guard time 
query against a piece of data and it comes back with a flawed result, you know that that data has changed from when you first put it there. And you can revert via a snap link to the other copy. And those examples are on the, uh, the Manta documentation site. So that's, that is all doable. In a way, it reminds me of what it by as I know, I had seen this many years back. I don't know if you uh, not for me. They, they had many nodes uh, full of hard disk with uh, anything even at the back. Yeah. You could ask for a file and it just looked like one big hard disk. CSS has been used by quite a number of other storage vendors as part of yeah, the applied things that yeah. CFS has been proven to be very, very robust. So one, one object is on, on one single server. Is that my understanding of, the, of this sentence? Every object is stored on two, two pools by policy default to open the server. So one, everything is on one server? Yes. Mm -hmm. is that it, and by default. So if, if you want more copies, you can change it. Oh, you can change your policy yep. to store somewhere else. Okay, thanks everyone. Over, so. Okay, well, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, hopefully it was geeky enough for you. Uh, if it was too geeky, uh, I assume you're still not here. <laughs> I won't apologize for it. Um, okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah, pick up your trash or whatever. Take that.